to Kids Rule TV, brought to you by English Heritage. I'm Esme and I'll be your guide as we time travel through English history. We'll be joined along the way by some fascinating historians and Hello. a few other helpers. Hello. So if you've ever wondered who built Stonehenge or how the Romans changed British history forever, then you've come to the right place. Coming up in today's show, we're journeying back 2,000 years into the world of Roman Britain. We'll discover how the Romans shaped our way of life today, including giving us fast food and a wall 73 miles long. Joining us is curator Francis McIntosh, who will be sharing what life was like for children living in the Roman Empire. And we'll be sampling a Roman burger and showing you how to make a stunning Roman mosaic at home. There's a lot to cover, so let's dive into this week's show. Our journey begins back in AD 43, at a time when British history changed forever. The Romans described Britain as a mysterious place inhabited by tribes of Britons and Celts. They were attracted to Britain's precious natural resources such as tin, gold and iron. And Roman emperors such as Caesar Ooh. and Claudius Hello. wanted the glory of conquering Britain and adding it to their great empire. Everything changed when the Roman army sailed over to Britain in wooden boats from Boulogne in France to the Kent coast. They first conquered the southeast of England before expanding west and north. But the Romans didn't just fight, they also built. As their territory grew, they expanded existing settlements into larger towns like London and Colchester. They built stone forts, grand houses and, of course, roads. In fact, they built 10,000 miles of them, which if laid end to end would get you from London to Sydney in Australia. They also brought with them great wealth, exotic foods and a new language called Latin. Emperor Claudius hoped his army would conquer the whole of Britain, but many tribes were unhappy about the Romans invading their land, especially those to the north. So in 122 AD, Emperor Hadrian ordered a great wall to be built to separate Roman Britain from the land inhabited by tribes further north. Let's find out more about life at the time, and I know just the expert who can help us. Hi Francis. Hi there. A warm welcome to our Roman episode. Can you tell everyone a bit about what you do at English Heritage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a collections curator. That means I look after the objects from the sites that are in my patch and I cover an area including Hadrian's Wall and the North East, so quite a big area. And I put together exhibitions, help researchers look at our collections and care for the objects alongside our conservators so that we can use them to tell people stories about our sites and the people who lived here. And I'm really lucky because no day is the same. Um, one week I'll be up a ladder cleaning back poo from a 19th century organ at Brinkburn Priory. The next I might be planning an exhibition at House of Four. And then the next day I might be recording a programme like this. Wow, sounds like such an interesting job. Maybe not the back poo though. I'm curious to find out more about the Roman arrival in Britain nearly 2000 years ago. How big was the Roman army? So the Roman army that came over consisted of about 40,000 men. And that was split into two types uh, of soldiers. There was the Roman general at the time. He was Aulus Plautius, who was in charge. And he had this invasion force. And there were four Roman legions, which are 5,000 men in each. That's 20,000 soldiers. And then the other half were multi-purpose auxiliary troops, which would include cavalry as well as infantry, you know, men on foot. And so that gives that total of 40,000 men. Wow, so it was quite the mission then. We think with all the men, the animals that came with it and the supplies that the Roman Navy probably needed between 700 and 1,000 transport ships just to get them across the channel. And were the Romans welcomed with open arms by people living in Britain at the time? Uh, not exactly, and I think we probably can guess that by the fact they had to take 40,000 soldiers with them. Um, Britain at the time was uh, ruled in different areas by different tribes. It's not one big um, kind of 
um, organization. And some tribes did submit. One tribe is the Dubunny, who were based around Gloucestershire. But a lot of the tribes really did put up a fight against the Romans. Now, I've heard that the Romans brought elephants with them. Is this true? Well, if we believe Cassius Dio, it is true. Cassius Dio says that once the battle at Colchester was almost won, Claudius was summoned by his general, Aulus Plautius, and he came with his elephants and his bodyguards to kind of oversee the final defeat. So it really um, <clears throat> had a big impact, I think, on the, the Britons who would never have seen something like that before. Absolutely. And who were the key players in the invasion? We've heard a bit about Emperor Claudius. Who was he and why was he important? So Claudius, or if you want to give him his full name, Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. He was an emperor um, who was never expected to be an emperor. He came into power in 41 AD after his nephew Gaius, who tends to be known mostly as Caligula, was murdered. Ah. Um, when Caligula was murdered, Claudius was the only adult male of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, that wider family he was part of, who was left alive. And the bodyguard of the emperor, the Praetorian Guard, proclaimed him emperor. Mm. Now, he'd never been expected to be emperor because his family thought his disabilities, which included uh, being slightly deaf and having a limp, made him unsuitable for public life. So it was quite a big ask for him to become emperor and although his bodyguards um, supported him, he needed the wider support of the Senate, the governing body of Rome, and the army. And a really good way to do that was to have a military victory. Yeah. And he chose Britain. He only stayed as an emperor until 54 AD when he died, but Britain remained part of the Roman Empire until 410 AD. So that decision that he made um, to invade us in 43 had a really long-lasting effect. Wow. The other important emperor that people at home will surely have heard of is Hadrian, who famously ordered his army to build a wall named after him. What can you tell us about him? So Hadrian, also another big long name, he's called Publius Aelius Hadrianus. And he was born in Rome, and we know his actual date, birth date, on the 24th of January, AD 76. Hadrian is known as a consolidator emperor. So he stopped invading new places like all the emperors had before him and he focused on sorting out the borders of the current empire so consolidating it making it safer and um, drawing the lines hadrian is also a really big fan of greek culture <laughs> um, and one aspect of this kind of culture was having beards so if you look at coins and statues of emperors before hadrian they're almost all clean shaven no facial hair but hadrian brings the beard in and that follows after him Thanks for that roundup, Francis. So what can you tell us about Hadrian's Wall? I heard it only took six years to build the wall all by hand. Yeah, that's right. And it's really quite an undertaking. So I would say only six years. It took around 15,000 men that six years, but it's 73 miles long. And it's got 16 forts. It's got 80 mile castles and it's got 160 turrets. So absolutely phenomenal undertaking for these men to uh, construct it in that short period of time. And I've got another fun fact for you. A cavalry regiment, who we know was stationed up on the wall, they're known as an hour, and that's 500 men right. with 500 horses. They would produce 6,500 tons of horse manure a year, which is the same weight as 800 elephants. Well, that's a lot of poo. I'm also interested to know more about what life was like for children in Roman Britain. Can you tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. It really depended on whether you were rich or poor. Um, life was very different for the two children. So if you were poor, um, you probably wouldn't be taught to read or write. You definitely wouldn't go to school and you would be put to work as soon as you could uh, walk and you would help your family in whatever their trade was. So, you know, if you're on a farm... You might help collect eggs or feed the animals from early on, and then you'd do other jobs as you got older. If you were a rich child, you'd have a much nicer life. You, um, you know, you'd have much nicer food and clothes. You'd have slaves to look after you, and you would be educated. Even if you were a girl, it wasn't just boys. Roman children didn't go to school until they were seven, and they'd probably know some of the alphabet beforehand, but then when they came to school, they'd learn to read and write and do arithmetic, and they'd also learn lots of poems and other important texts. How interesting. And what did kids do for fun? 
Well, I've actually got a few objects out of our museum case to show you from our collection to help explain this. I've got to handle them really carefully because they're almost 2,000 years old. So I've put my gloves on. But this one here is the leg from a doll and it's made out of bone. And this here is you know, really beautiful. You can even see on the foot the lines where they've drawn on a sandal. And we know children had toys such as dolls or balls. They had little uh, animals, either in clay or bone, even ones with wheels that they could pull along. So things that you'd recognise now in a nursery. Wow, that's incredible. It looks so fragile, you're right. So we know from archaeological evidence that children had dolls in Roman times, but what about games? So we know about quite a lot of Roman games, particularly Roman board games, but what we don't know is if board games were only played by adults or they might be played by children as well. But I thought I'd bring a few things to talk about some of them because we do know some of the rules. So they had one board game, which is quite similar to noughts and crosses or tic-tac-toe, people call, with the nine squares. Then we have another one which sounds really interesting called ludus latrunculi, and that's the Latin uh, means that a soldier's or robber's game. And we don't know exactly the rules, but it's something to do with having to steal your player's pieces by a move. Games that we know children definitely play, even if they don't, didn't play um, board games, is um, maybe games with a dice. So I've brought a dice along as well, which is made of bone here. And you can see it's got the numbers marked out by circles. It doesn't say one. It's got one circle or got three circles. And they'd also have played things such as knuckle bones, now, knuckle bones, they're the knuckles in our fingers. The children would have played with bones maybe from sheep or goat, and you'd throw them up in the air and have to catch them either in a cup. So I've brought a little cup along here. Again, this is bone. So you'd maybe shake your knuckle bones around, throw them up and try and catch them either in the cup or in your hand, or guess which way up uh, they went. So lots of different games, some of which we kind of recognise now, and they're similar. Amazing. Now... I've heard the Romans were also big on hygiene and they loved to bathe, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. And we can see um, kind of the Roman baths in our modern spas. So if you go to a modern spa today, they've got plunge pools, steam rooms, saunas, cold rooms. That's all based on the Roman designs. And we're really lucky at English Heritage because we look after some sites that have got just some wonderful Roman baths preserved. So at Roxeter, which was a town first built in AD 90 and claim to fame, fourth largest city in Roman Britain, um, there you can go and see the remains of the bathhouse. You can see all the different rooms um, and how they were used. And at Chester's Fort on Hadrian's Wall, the walls of the bathhouse stand above head height and you can see how the air was used to heat both under the floor and along the walls and the ceilings. And they're really amazing survivals. I'm curious to find out what life was like for children in Roxeter. So let's meet Verokovo and Claudius and follow their day at a Roman bathhouse. After a week working on his family's farm, Varakovo is visiting his cousin Claudius in one of Britain's biggest cities, Varaconium cornoviorum, which we now call Roxeter. The bathhouse is a huge building. The men and women bathed at different times, so Varakovo and Claudius arrive with their dads as their mums are leaving. The Romans take bathing very seriously. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, everyone gets to go to the baths changing and bathing next to each other. Before they get clean, Claudius suggests they go to the Basilica, a large hall, where they can run, try ball games and weightlifting. But the boys decide to wrestle instead. The boys 
boys head to the hot room. The heat is created by a fire below the floor and they have to wear wooden shoes to stop their feet from burning. Soldiers of the Roman army are visiting from Chester. Virakovo hasn't met a legionary before and asks him about army life. First of the hot pools, slaves clean the boys by covering them in oil and scraping it off again. Once they're clean, it's time to finish off with a quick dip in the cold pool. It's a bit of a shock for Virakovo though. After changing, the boys meet their parents for some dinner. The shops nearby sell hot foods such as soup and meat and sweet pastries for dessert. Well, that looks like a very nice way to spend a day. Now, we saw in the video that Virakovo and Claudius went to a street seller to get their food. Was this very common? Uh, yeah, more common than you might think, because actually many of the houses, particularly um, those for the poorer people, would be very small. Um, in the big towns, they might be flats, and there wouldn't be any cooking facilities because having a fire in those closely spaced houses that were probably made of wood would be really dangerous. So a lot of houses wouldn't have the facilities to cook. So they would go and buy uh, food, at, you know, the equivalent of a fast food uh, vendor. So what sort of foods did the Romans bring to Britain? Now, you might think, oh, Italy, let's have a think, pizza and pasta. But unfortunately, um, it's not true. Tomatoes, really key for particularly pizzas, over to Europe until much later. They, they originate in the Americas. And there was also no ice cream. That's a much later invention too. So some of the, the real standard Italian food did not come over with the Romans to Britain. But they did bring quite a lot of food. Um, some of them were quite healthy. They introduced lots of fruits and vegetables, say pears and figs, cucumbers and carrots. And also the trade links that the empire brought introduced and allowed um, more exotic things to be brought into Britain. Um, there was black pepper, mint, mustard, and then three real staples of the Roman Empire's diet were olive oil, which mostly came from Spain and North Africa, wine. The Romans um, were not impressed with the British drinking beer. Um, they wanted their wine. And also garum, which is G-A-R-U-M. And that was a fish sauce. And you might think, oh, not too bad. We have fish sauce today and say stir fries. But their fish sauce is made from uh, rotting fish guts. So not really something I'd like to try. Mm, not so sure about that one. So was the diet of the native Britons quite basic then before the Roman invasion? No, not necessarily. Just different. And, you know, even before the Romans arrived in Britain, some of the British people would have had access to olive oil and wine because there were a few trade links. But everyone likes their home comforts. And the Romans, when they moved over here, wanted to bring things that they knew and liked but there would actually have been quite a lot of similarity in the diet of the Iron Age people or the British Celtic people here and many of the Romans. It's only going to have been the really rich who would have had access to such exotic foods. You know, um, for most of the poorer Romans and the native Britons, their diet would have been really simple and wouldn't have been much different before 43 or after 43. There would have been lots of things such as cereals. Um, which is not breakfast cereals like we have, but the wheat or the barley, and um, there would have been peas and beans. And then if you're lucky, you'd have a little bit of meat, but quite simple, really. Mm, well, thank you, Francis. It's been so interesting chatting to you. Bye for now. Goodbye. Yeah. All the 
this talk of food is making me hungry. Let me see if I can find a tasty Roman recipe. Here we go, the Roman burger. If you want to try this recipe at home, you'll need 500 grams of minced meat, 60 grams of pine nuts, three teaspoons of garum, a salty fish sauce, or you can use regular salt if preferred, ground pepper, a handful of coriander, and juniper berries, which are optional. And just like that, here it is. Mm. I've got a veggie version, which you can create at home too, using plant-based mints and vegetarian fish sauce. Right, I'm gonna dive in. Ooh. Mm. Did you know that it took 15,000 men to build Hadrian's Wall? We sent two English heritage members to Halstead's Roman fort to find out what life was like for a Roman legionary. Let's take a look. Sing, Jack, sing. Consistise, intente. Hi, I'm Peter. And I'm Amy. We're here at Harstead's Roman Fort in Northumberland to meet Marcus the Legionary. We've got lots of questions about what life would have been like on Hadrian's Wall. Hello. Salve. I am a Roman Legionary, part of the legion which built the fort at Harstead's. What is a legionary? A legionary has to be a citizen of Rome. There are over 30 legions in the Roman army. Each one has 5,000 men. Where did the soldiers live? Each group of eight soldiers would have two rooms. One room, you keep all your kit and you have a little stove that you can cook all your food with. The other room, you sleep in. What did the soldiers wear? You start off with the tunic. It looks like a big skirt. You also get a cloak. You've got leather sandals called Caligai. You're also wearing socks because it's cold. You've got a helmet called a gallia that's lined with sheep's wool. You have an armor. You have a leather belt. You have a sword and a knife and a spear and a shield called a scutum. What food did the soldiers eat? The soldiers were allowed one pound of meat which was usually pork, army bread, or they may have biscuits. Now, this is not a biscuit like you would eat. This is just flour, water, and salt, and it's absolutely rock hard. You'd cook with a sauce called liquamen, made out of fermented fish guts. Where would Roman soldiers go for the toilet? There's a special toilet in each fort. There's a one here in Housestead's fort. There would be benches with holes in it, and underneath the benches, there would be water flowing. And what you do when you're finished, you wipe your bum with one of these, and then you put it back in the bucket for the next person to use. Did they ever have doctors or nurses at Housestead? Well, there is a hospital here, and the treatment they had was very, very good. What language would the people speak? They would have to learn Latin, because that was the, the language the army spoke. The soldiers would speak all kinds of languages because they would have come from all kinds of places all over the Roman Empire. time of the show when we flex our creative muscles. This week we're sharing our guide to creating a Roman mosaic. You can use paper, coloured cardboard, marbles or even old dried beans. Are you ready? Let's get creative. Wealthy Roman people decorated their homes with fantastic images. They would paint murals on their plaster walls and cover the floors with mosaics. Mosaics were pictures made up of tiny coloured stones and stuck to the floor with mortar, which is a kind of cement. They created geometric patterns, scenes from everyday life, or the stories of gods and goddesses. Because they were made from stone, they've lasted a very long time. You can go to see them all over England. There are lots of ways you can create mosaics at home. You can cut small squares from coloured paper and stick them down with glue. 
It helps to draw a pencil guideline first. If all that cutting seems like hard work, you can use a stamp to make the squares. But if you want to get messy, you can use air drying clay. Fill the lid of an ice cream tub with clay and press things into it to create your design. You can use lentils and beans, beads and sequins, shells and pebbles, anything you like. Now that you know how to make mosaics, why not have a go yourself? How cool was that? I had no idea that a handful of dried beans could look so beautiful. So here's my attempt. Ta-da! Mm. Uh, how did you guys get on at home? As always, we'd love to see your creations. So if you've had a go at cooking a Roman burger or been inspired by our historical crafts, then do share them with us here at kids at english-heritage.org.uk. And that brings us to the end of our show. I hope you've enjoyed watching and feel inspired to get out and explore all the amazing historic Roman places that English Heritage cares for. Don't forget to subscribe and for more activities and fascinating history facts, make sure to visit the Kids Rule website. Bye for now.